Hi, this is Richard Nelson with the Commonwealth Policy Center. Thank you for joining the Commonwealth Matters. In today's program, we are talking about biblical masculinity. What is it and why does it matter today? Now, some would say that the Bible is outdated and a patriarchal textbook used to suppress women. However, some say, like our guest Jordan Tong, that the Bible speaks to human nature and God's design for both men and women. And just for the record, I do believe with Jordan as well that the Bible is our guidebook for all areas of life. And uh, Jordan, I'd like to hear more about what you have to say. Welcome to the program, by the way. Yeah, thanks, Richard. No, this, is, this is good. I appreciate all the work that you and CPC do and and for this program. So I'm excited to talk about this, this topic. No, this is good. And full disclosure, Jordan is a personal friend. He served as the president of the CPC board for a couple of years and a dear brother in the Lord as well. Jordan, the reason I wanted to do this program is because you have um, spoken out on biblical masculinity in particular. I noticed some posts, I think it was late in the spring where you and your boys started a uh, log splitting business. And you were, um, of course, posting pictures of your young boys working and talking about ways to build up boys, to develop masculine traits, to become independent, to become providers for their family, to develop skills. And I thought, man, this is really good stuff. And I'm not hearing it from, from anywhere else. So tell me, what led you, first of all, to do that with your boys? And then I want to pivot over to why is biblical masculinity important? Yeah, so a good question. One one of the the reasons that led me to to doing that is um, less about the masculinity thing and more about that I have six kids and four of them are boys and you know like a lot of Americans like we're just my kids are well off and don't want for anything. I mean, they're, sure there are things that that they don't get that they would want, but you know by the rest of history standards like my kids have it really really well yeah. and so but I was seeing some laziness in my boys and like just not wanting to work hard assuming mom and dad are going to pay for everything and um, my oldest son is 14 and it's like hey I'm, I want to get a truck when I'm 16 you know and so um, I thought man they need to be doing something to work and earn money and learn some of the principles of hard work and making money there was also some I'd love for them to know how to do their own business. And it also gave me as dad time to interact with them. Um, but yeah, along the way, it's really been a good opportunity to start working on some traits that I think are important for men in general to have. Yeah. So could you define So just to be clear for all the listeners and the benefit of all those watching this as well, um, what is biblical masculinity? How would you define biblical masculinity? Yeah, that's a good question. So in some ways, like the Bible doesn't give us a prescription for this necessarily in, you know, in that it says, he, here's exactly what it is. It's in many ways, it's one of those natural things that the word clearly says that God created a gendered humanity and made them distinct male and female. Well, um, but then also you get right out of Genesis, like there's this complementarity between the two that they are distinct um, and they're made in God's image, but kind of imaging him in some ways the same and maybe in some ways different. And and so I think we my starting point as a Christian is that there is something that it means to be male or masculine that's distinct from being female. Um, and I think men should aspire to be godly masculine men and women should aspire to be godly feminine women. Like we're oriented in different directions in that way. Right. And we can sort of maybe get into some of the nuances of this. And um, and I'm happy to share, like there's a kind of a cultural reason that really pressed this question on me. Well, unpack that. Tell us why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... So, you know, I've done some work in Christian apologetics, which is then sometimes responding to objections that Christians face in the culture. And, you know, right now, the, the same-sex marriage movement, homosexuality, transgenderism, there's a push right now in culture. There's a really strong push, kind of a wave that's swept over the country that that really the sexes are interchangeable. And there's nothing, there's no, this is how it ought to be. 
And so men can stand in for women. Women can stand in for men. A, a man could actually become a woman. Like the, there's no fixed boundaries at all yeah. in this regard. And so as Christians, as we think about interacting with that particular um, cultural phenomenon, a lot of Christians resort to the scriptures to talk about, you know, same-sex relationships and what marriage is supposed to look like. And I think there's there's a good scriptural argument, but I think there's a really good natural argument, uh, just from natural theology, that there is a distinction, and we can draw out what those distinctions are. So the, the really the first thing that got me on this is that, hey, if, if we don't have a good theology of gender, we're going to have a really hard time discussing intelligently and interacting with the sexual revolution that we have. Like, what is male? What is female? What is marriage? What's the orientation of that? Um, so that, that was a big impetus for me. And now that I have kids, four boys and two girls, it raised this other question of, all right, if my kids are like arrows, you know, and I'm aiming them and I want them to launch well and be good adults and citizens and followers of Jesus, like there is a little bit different aim for my sons than for my daughters. And so I, I really was wanting to wrestle with what, what is that? Like, where, where are those distinctions? Um, and I think the church can do a better job of being a voice for that. Yeah. So Jordan, certainly the culture pushes um, a different worldview when it comes to the genders uh, and the differences between the two genders. Uh, and I should be more clear between the sexes, gender is the social manifestation of sex, mm -hmm. uh, male or female, but the sexual categories, you're talking about biology, male biology, female biology, Gender is how um, those biological realities are manifested. It's in your dress. Uh, it's in your fashion, um, th things like that. But culture certainly pushes against the idea that there's a difference between the two. That, as you said, they're interchangeable. Uh, culture certainly is pushed against the idea that there are sexual um, boundaries. Let's just put it that way. Sexual rules for human beings. Uh it, right now, the U.S. Senate passed a bill just days ago, uh, the Respect for Marriage Act. Twelve Republicans got on board with that as well. Uh, it was actually a, a indication that the entire Senate's going to vote for it. We live in a, in a time of uh, essentially where people can define their own sexuality and their own moral boundaries and their own um, gender uh, affinities. Uh, so what you're saying is is radically opposed to that, that we have uh, our creator makes us male and female, and there are certain um, uh, directions, uh, a bend that male and female has. How do you, so I want to go to, how do you say, how do you address somebody who says you're being oppressive to mm -hmm. women, or you're imposing um, your view of human sexuality on people? How would you respond to that? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, and also, you have to realize, too, this is not just the sexual revolution, but you have a whole host of, like, first and second wave feminism that sort of is playing into this conversation, <laughs> uh, making it more a bit more complicated as well, um, where the people that are opposed to the conversation are a bit more. And But all those issues kind of weave together a little bit. So I think that... As I had done some study in the past in apologetics and talked a lot in that that area, is everybody is dealing with the same reality, and so they're you know. And when we live, don't live in light of reality. We always bump up against it, <laughs> and by that I mean so if you you know if I said you know there's no such thing as gravity, and then I go to walk off the edge of my roof here, I'm going to fall and reality will act as a check on that. Yeah. And so I think where I'm trying to go with somebody like that is I, I want them to see and observe that there are objective things about the world. Like there are certain things that this is the way it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody on some level agrees with that. Mm -hmm. um, like for instance, we know for instance, that it's wrong to torture innocent people for the fun of it. Like everyone knows that morally that's repugnant and it's wrong. And it's not me imposing my standard on you. It's me imposing the standard that, or I'm 
proclaiming the standard that imposes itself on both of us when I do that. Um, we also know that doing whatever we feel is okay or right doesn't necessarily always work either, right? Like everybody has limits there on where, where they think that can go. Mm-hmm. So my pushback would always be, hey, you have a standard too. So let's talk about why you have your standard and where it came from. And hopefully we can maybe flesh some of these things out together. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but that's the, that's the way I would begin that conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. That they're doing the very same thing themselves. They're just playing the pious person. And yeah. pretending. Yeah. I think you explained it well. I think, though, too, we live in a time where, especially for conservatives that have a conservative position, we're often told that you're imposing your views or you're using the Bible to oppress people. And to your point, we all have a, a worldview and a perspective by which we address the issues. Uh, and I think the way to begin, I just had a lunch meeting earlier with uh, somebody. We we're talking about ultimate values. And at some sense, there has to be a higher authority outside of human beings by which we judge right and wrong. Right. And you and I, as followers of Jesus, we look at we look to God and we look to the word to speak to to these uh, to these issues. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, so, and our government has recognized, that, at least in the founding, that it was laws outside of us <laughs> that gave us the right to institute the very laws that we did institute um, because they came from God and not they're not created by people. And you're right. Politics and these sort of things are hopelessly religious. <laughs> yeah. You can't get around that. You you may be Marxist or Muslim or secular humanist or whatever it is or Christian, but it's it very much is a moral and religious question. You start talking about that authority. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's get back to you and your kids. You've got four boys, two girls, you're training your boys to do manly things. And I could not help but notice on your Facebook posts, you've got these pictures of you and your boys doing some things that are pretty rugged and you're challenging them. Uh, So, so what is the difference at, at, as a dad, you see differences in your boys and differences in your two girls. What is the difference between uh, to uh, between your boys and girls? What are some? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, um, my daughter, I have a twelve year old daughter, and then I have a, a newborn daughter. And so, one difference that I've seen pop up that's that's real obvious, and every parent that has both sexes of kids will see this, is that. As a general rule, my boys are wilder, rougher, um, coarser. (laughs) Um, They are riskier. Mm -hmm. And the things that they delight in are just substantially different than what my daughter does. So she is much more um, intentional and careful and... Um, nourishing I guess this may be the right kind of word uh, or mothering <laughs> sort of like the way she treats the newborn and that sort of thing her attention to detail and things with beauty like she just there's a femininity about her <laughs> it's we're, it's hard to, to sometimes describe something that you're so used to saying like you can kind of point to it and say that's feminine that's graceful that's soft beauty you know um it's hard to put into words sometimes what what those things are no I, and i think you put into words well jordan uh however i'm going to play devil's advocate and say have your children been conditioned to embrace their femininity as girls or their masculinity as boys did you give your boys trucks to play with as soon as they were crawling around on the ground or did you give your daughter a doll as soon as she was a year old and and could snuggle with it I mean, some would say that they people, young children are conditioned to embrace yeah. their gender. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. I, I think that, I mean, you look at the studies on that, that this whole like gender dysphoria stuff that happens with young kids all, almost always resolves itself at puberty. Um, and, you know, so having a daughter and sons, like my younger boys I have twins that are seven. The older sister does spend a lot of time with them. And so there'll be certain times where the, you know, one of my twin boys is walking around pretending to breastfeed a baby doll, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and it's, I don't make a big deal of it. You know, they're just with their sister and they're figuring out the world, you know, but 
but right after that, they may, you know, pretend that they're the baby's a bad guy and they're going to throw it off the balcony. You know what I mean? They just, so there is, even in those contexts, the boys, their, their orientation, just the way they view the world is just a little bit different. And I do, I think this ties into the roles God has made for them. And we can sort of flesh that out a little bit too. By the way, there was a, uh, a study done uh, a couple of years ago about the very question I asked you, are children conditioned to embrace their biological sex? And uh, they gave, so in this study, they gave young boys um, dolls and uh, kitchen play sets and things of that nature. And they gave the, the uh, young girls um, GI Joes and camouflage and that kind of thing. And what they found was that the boys were still hardwired to play like boys. I think they turned their Barbie dolls into guns and were shooting each other yeah. with their Barbie dolls. And same with the girls, that it's not necessarily the uh, um, outside influences, but we're hardwired. Yeah. Uh, boys are hardwired to be boys. Girls are hardwired to be girls and feminine. So Yeah. And let me, so a, a really common pushback to this is to say that, well, hey, this boy over here is softer and more emotional and more nurturing and this girl is less nurturing and more rugged or whatever and so I think a good way to think about this is the idea of a bell curve and so if you think about it, let's let's take a uh, an easy and obvious one is strength okay so like just physical strength if you look at and let's say the the further you go on the bell curve the stronger someone is the female bell curve is going to be back this way. Okay. And the male curve is going to be shifted over to the right. Now there are some females that are stronger than males. Mm -hmm. So like the bell curves will overlap a, a bit, but as a rule, as a group, men are more are stronger physically than women. Women as a rule, as a group are more relational than men and more nurturing men as a rule as a group are more aggressive than women so there are masculine traits and feminine traits i think orient towards the the sort of the roles that god has designed us for too yeah no, that's good if you're just joining us you're listening to the commonwealth matters i'm richard nelson here with jordan tong and we're talking biblical masculinity we're going to take a break and we'll be back in just a moment Welcome back to the Commonwealth Matters. Richard Nelson here with Jordan Tong, and we are talking about biblical masculinity. And Jordan, I, I want to start back with in this segment with um, the idea that there is a crisis of masculinity in our culture, if I could put it that way. Uh, I would argue that um, our general culture has criticized masculinity. They've criticized the idea of the nuclear family, a man uh, and a woman together in marriage, raising children with the man as the head of the household. That is a minority view, I would argue, in our culture today. Um, and then there's a lot of talk of toxic masculinity. And uh, I know you've you've addressed this. Um, how would you, uh, how, how do you, I'm going to start out with this. Let me take a step back. Uh, here's something from the American Psychological Association defining toxic masculinity. They call it the constellation of socially regressive masculine traits that serve to foster domination, the devaluation of women, homophobia, and wanton violence. So let's be clear, what you're <laughs> yeah. talking about with biblical masculinity, it's it's not this, is it? Yeah, I don't think so. No, 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 no. Those are really loaded social words, <laughs> but, but, but you're right. Like uh, sin is sin. And so to be um violent in a way that's sinful is wrong to be fearful or homophobic is sinful you know those to devalue women is sinful so yeah that i would call them sinful or toxic <laughs> traits um the problem is is that many masculine things get lumped into that that bucket yeah and here's one of the lumping in uh so thanks for bringing that up but the biblical idea of masculinity within a marriage is that the um, a husband uh, loves his wife, a husband serves his wife, even goes to the extent of laying down his life for his wife. Um, but there's also a hierarchy within marriage as well. 
And that's the biblical model. There's the headship, male headship in the home, in, in that family. Uh, and those who say, well, that's, how, how would you, so you and I agree that that's the biblical position. How would you respond to somebody that would say that's toxic? You're putting women down. You're subordinating women. Yeah. That's a tough question, isn't it? But how, how do you? Yeah, uh, no, I think, that? yeah, absolutely. So part of me, I want to be sensitive to that and maybe try to flesh it out. Um, it's definitely a 21st and 20th century objection. <laughs> um, and, and particularly a Western individualistic objection. Um, I think we all recognize spheres of authority and hierarchy in life and difference in position in terms of power or whatever um, and authority doesn't have an, an doesn't affect or change the intrinsic value of something. So for instance, I, I'm an authority over my children, but they have just as much intrinsic value and worth as me. But the nature of the relationship um, is that I think also you can't, in many ways, you can't get around having authorities in life in general. I mean, if you work in the workplace, if you're involved with government, you know, religion, Christianity, the church, no matter what, there's, there's always hierarchy. I mean, the, the world is hierarchical. <laughs> I guess that's the nature of living with other human beings. Um, and you're right. It does seem clear in, uh, in scripture that that's a, a spot where men are to, um, to lead and to be the heads of their home or to, to rule. And I don't mean that in a tyrannical sense, but like that's, <laughs> that is their role. Um, and, and for all of human history, like that's what men have done. <laughs> now, maybe the pushback is, well, it's been wrong for all of human history, but it's, it's, that has been the way like men have ruled and led and homes and governments and institutions like that's, that has been, doesn't mean women have never done that or that they couldn't never do that. And I think the Bible has instances where that happens, you know, with Deborah in the Old Testament, for instance. Um, so in Esther, like this, obviously there's places for that. But as a rule, as a group, like men lead and rule, like that's, that's sort of hardwired. I don't think you can, if you tried to change that, the world and reality would reverse course on you. <laughs> um, it's just the way it's always been throughout history. So it would be one of my initial pushbacks to that. Like I, um, I don't want to know what is the thing under here that's bothering you so much. Yeah. So Jordan, uh, what you're, uh, what we're talking about is a biblical view on masculinity and on femininity by default. Um, but we're not hearing a lot from the church on this, are we? We're not hearing pastors speak of the differences between the sexes. We're not hearing about maybe the danger of feminizing boys. And I would argue that there is a feminization of young men today. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're seeing, for example, young men or young men and women not getting married, uh, young men becoming committed to raising a family, even young men uh, joining the workforce. Um, mm -hmm. But what, I want to go back to is, should the church begin to speak on this issue? And why should they speak on it? Yeah, there's some, that's an area I've read about a lot lately. There's a great book, I think by David Morrow, I think is the guy's name, um, but it's called Why Men Hate Going to Church. And this is sort of like a broadly evangelical guy that um, was kind of goes to like a big Eva megachurch kind of thing and just did a bunch of study and research, like noticing these trends because churches trend women 60, 40 ish, something like that. Uh, and and I think there's some other things happening in culture. So most people now are getting familiar with Jordan Peterson. And what's been fascinating about him, he's not a Christian, maybe on the verge of becoming a Christian. I don't know. But um, his primary audience is young men. <laughs> and I think that both in the church and outside the church, men feel unmoored or they feel kind of lost at sea in the culture. And he's become a voice um, that millions of young men are listening to and saying obvious things that men who are feeling these pressures <laughs> um, 
are feeling and thinking. And and he actually recently made a video really challenging churches to step up and address this issue Mm -hmm. that the churches in many ways have not done a good job here. Um, And, you know, singing romantic love songs to Jesus on Sundays is, (laughs) you know, not necessarily the way to win the hearts of these men. And um, I'm all about singing on Sunday. I think men should sing. Um, But yeah, I think the church as a general has, has not done well there. And I think a, a lot of people, if you would step into a church, you would see, you know, a lot of women who are the spiritual leaders in their home and, um, so I want to be careful I'm not like placing the blame on women. <laughs> um, as part of this is a call to men to to rise up as well. Um, but I, f- I feel like there's probably a bit more of an egalitarian spirit in the church now, just collect this as a whole. Um, and so men, I think, feel a bit. They feel the pressure from some of these things, you know, to be masculine is not seen as masculinity and godliness are not seen as things to go together. So one of the things in Morrow's book that uh, the Why Men Hate Going to Church, they did this study and they list, he took from like secular psychology, like the top 10 traits that men exhibit and then the top 10 traits that women exhibit Hmm. and gave the, it didn't tell what those lists were, but says which list of virtues or qualities is more Christ-like. And like 90 some odd percent of the people said the feminine ones, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, so they were just, you know, things uh, I'd have to, I'll botch it up if I try to explain what it was, but some things that men are longing for. So the idea of going out and subduing the earth and building something, or you could use the word conquering, like yeah. men are hardwired to want to go take the hill. Yeah. And they want to challenge. They want to rise up to something. Men are hardwired to want to take risks, even though we're like fearful of it. Yeah. Like that's something that my daughter and my wife does not understand. Like she, and I'm glad she doesn't like, she wants to protect and nurture and take care of this over here, right. but it's the taking risks. It's the taking the hill. It's the dying on the beaches of Normandy. It's Christ saying, I must go to Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's Martin Luther. Here I stand. I can do no other. It's yeah. it's these things that build society and that fight against evil and that seek flourishing of the people, so that women and children have a space to flourish. And men long to be that. Yeah. And there are qualities that they need to grow in to get there. You know, some I mean, boldness and courage and the ability to take risks and being able to endure pain and hardship. Um, and and be strong, like mentally and physically and in terms of virtue. Um, you know, these all these qualities begin to build a stable society. So back to something you said earlier about it's violence, good. like yeah. a man should be capable of violence, but virtuous enough to withhold it. And And if you have streets full of homes with men like that, it keeps a check on evil, unruly young men. That's good. <laughs> so the best defense my daughter has against somebody coming and treating her ill is me being a a threat <laughs> of some sort for that young man. But to guard and protect the garden that I have at home. That's good. J- Jordan well said, and the reason that is the reason why the church needs to speak to masculinity and speak to gender differences. Uh, A culture without virtue is a dangerous culture, Mm. dangerous for our families and for our children as well. Jordan, we are out of time, unfortunately. I've enjoyed this program. This is a great discussion. I think we need to maybe do this again sometime. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to. There's a lot more to say on this, uh, so maybe we can do that again. All right, God bless you. Appreciate you, brother. All right, take care. Bye-bye.